Okay, welcome. Welcome everybody out there and thanks to all of our viewers for tuning in this evening. My name is Sally Clifton-Parks and I'll be facilitating the webinar tonight. Our topic tonight is water birds, migratory and permanent residents. And this is the final presentation in our four part VAS one wrap webinar series. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country that we are meeting on today and honour the elders past, present and emerging. If this is your first webinar experience, please note that no one can see you or hear you. And if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that you have a chat button. So if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to ask throughout the webinar, please type them in here and our presenters will answer them at the end of the presentation. So just please make sure that you select the all attendees and panelists from the drop down arrow to send your questions to. When the webinar closes, there'll be a quick two minute survey that pops up and we'd really appreciate you filling that in and getting your feedback from tonight's webinar. Um, if we're going over time um, towards the end of the webinar, I'll jump in and give you the option, uh, option to leave the webinar if you need to, um, otherwise we can keep going with some more questions. So our speaker tonight is Kim Williams from the Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions. Kim is the Nature Conservation Program Leader for the Southwest Region and he's been active in the management of the Vaswanarup wetlands and the adjoining conservation reserve since 1985. Kim reinstated a monthly water bird monitoring program across the wetlands in 2015, which continues today and is the basis for his presentation tonight. So I'll hand over to Kim now for the presentation. Welcome, Kim. Thank you, Sally. Um, yes, yeah, so my presentation tonight is about the vast wanderer at wetlands and the water birds. It's a short introduction, if you like, to the various complex elements that make up the water bird fauna of the wetland uh, and the very interesting things that can happen at the vast wanderer in relation to water birds. So the vast wanderer at wetlands a southwest icon of international importance. So the vast water wetland system, what is it? Essentially the system comprises two lagoonal wetlands, the vast and the water up. These occupy about 750 hectares. In seasonal times in the winter and when the water levels are high, the two wetlands are connected by a, a seasonal creek called Malbuck Creek. Part of the wetland system, the official conservation component of the wetland system also includes portions of the Chuot Forest National Park. And this relates to the tree hollows and the availability of tree hollows for duck and other species breeding. And the combined system then exits at the Wanara Inlet. You've covered a lot of this type of country before in relation to the water and the water management through the previous presentations. So this is just a brief introduction as to what are the main components. The water birds of the vast water up are very complex and dynamic community. When we think about water birds, we often just think of ducks or swans or a few species, but actually the birds that make up the vast water up wetland birds represent many different types of groups of, of birds coming from various locations. So if we have a quick look at this, we certainly have international migratory shorebirds. These are our summer visitors. These come from other parts of the world and migrate and feed in the summer period in the vast water. We have our Australian seasonal migrants, things I've called the grey nomads. These are species that essentially follow the sun and so they're here over the summer and go to other places in Australia when our wintry conditions arrive. We have some episodic opportunists, things that just fly in occasionally an eruption, feed briefly for a month or two and then move off and we might not see them again for three or four or five years. We certainly have a series of residential species, those that are found permanently in the wetlands. And then we're talking about the wetlands, we're thinking about the wet lagoonal elements, but actually there's a series of bird species that survive and um, live around the periphery of the wetlands. These, if you like, you consider these to be the outer suburbs, the so things that don't necessarily depend on the wetlands, but exploit the wetlands for a range of food and nesting and other items during the course of the year. And then 
excitingly, we also occasionally get vagrant species. These are ones that are unexpected. They are often blown off course. They come from wherever in the world. Uh, you could call them the lost species. So when we talk about the water birds of the vast fauna, we're really talking about a whole mix match of different types of species with different requirements from different points of origin. So what's the big deal about the water birds in the vast one up? And are these wetlands in relation to water birds any different to others? To answer that, you type of need to understand the position and the place that these wetlands, the vast one up have in the bigger picture of the world. So one of the important things is birds are highly dynamic and highly mobile. And many of those species cover huge distances on an annual basis. Right around the world, patterns of bird movement have been identified and these are called flyways. So the main flyway for us in, the, in Australia is called the East Asian Australasian flyway. And this is one of the great natural wonders of the world, the migration of thousands of individual species of birds from the breeding grounds in Alaska and Siberia all the way through to their non-breeding and feeding grounds in Australia and New Zealand. This flyway, as depicted by the blue boundaries on this, on this slide, cover nearly 23 countries and nearly half of the world's human population occur in these countries. As a result of that and expanding development, industries and various other uh, influences, the flyway is in danger of collapse. By collapse, that means that the places along the way that the birds would often stop for feeding and for rest and recuperation are being changed. They're being lost, the wetlands are being changed, they're being built on, they're being drying out or various other things. Many of the birds that make these big journeys are not capable of flying the entire distance in one hit. There are some that can. The godwits, for instance, start off in Siberia and four to five days later, they're in Australia. They fly nonstop not feeding at all, and they sleep on the wing as they fly. But most of the birds are much smaller than that and they need to stop, refuel for a few days and continue their journey. Bass Wannarup is one of the key feeding sites for migratory birds in the southwest of Australia. As a result of these flyways and the movement of birds across many countries, uh, there are a series of international conservation treaties that federal government signs with other countries in the order to protect the flyway, protect the feeding grounds and protect the movement of these birds so they can continue their natural cycles. There are a number of these conservation treaties, including JAMBA or the Japan Australia Migratory Bird Agreement, CAMBA, the China Australia Migratory Bird Agreement, Rock CAMBA, the Republic of Korea, Australia Migratory Bird Agreement. These agreements list a series of species that occur in both of these countries and the provisions and the actions that each government agrees to undertake to protect them. Of the species that are listed, 31 of these have been known to occur at the Bass Wanarup wetlands. There's also a convention, an international convention on migratory species of wild animals called the Bond Convention. Locally in Australia, we have federal government legislation, this Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Act, which recognises the value of Ramsar wetlands, I'll come to that, and migratory species. And it gives these two classes of assets, biodiversity assets, the, the name matters of national environmental significance. There's a series of laws and considerations that need to be undertaken when undertaking a development or a some type of disturbance which might impact on these matters of national environmental significance. Probably the most important international convention or agreement is the Ramsar Convention. This is um, a convention on wetlands of international importance. It commenced in 1971 in Ramsar, which is the name of a small town in Iran. And it was the first international treaty aimed at conserving natural resources. The broad aims of the treaty are to halt the worldwide loss of wetlands and to conserve those that remain through the wise use and the management. There are 158 different countries have signed on to the treaty and Australia signed on in 1974 and in fact was the first country anywhere in the world to designate or nominate a particular wetland for inclusion on the treaty. 
This was the Coburg Peninsula in the Northern Territory. There are currently 65 designated Ramsar sites in Australia, 11 of them in mainland WA. The Vats Wannarit was listed in 1990. The listing criteria for Vas Wannarit include two key elements. Criterion number five, which says that the wetland to be warranted or qualified as a Ramsar wetland needs to support at least 20,000 water birds at any one time during the year. And Ramsar criterion six, which says this wetland should support at least 1% of the population of the species. For the Vas Wannarit, there are four species that meet this criteria. So the next question, we have these international criteria and the Ramsar criteria. Are the Vatswana wetlands meeting their Ramsar targets? And if not, why not? To answer that, we actually need to know how many birds we've got, when and where they arrive from, and what species we have. So that means there needs to be a monitoring program. So there is a monitoring program. It is a monthly monitoring program undertaken by officers and my colleagues from the Parks and Wildlife Service. The program consists of monitoring on a monthly basis at 10 different sites across the system. The monitoring includes counting all birds of all species at all sites in one day. So this requires generally two people with sunrise starts and at peak times takes about nine hours to count all the birds. There's a picture of one of my colleagues dressed in waders with her scope standing in the water at the start of one of our count sessions. The results from these counts have identified that there's over 100 species recorded in total so far for the Bass Wanderer, but on an average monthly count, we get around the 45 to 55. The peak numbers of water birds that have been recorded and any one time at the Bass Wanderer is over 37,000 individuals. Let's move on. Let's have a look at how our results have been for the last five years of our monthly counts. Now on this chart, we can see months down the bottom, the years across the top, the numbers of birds on the left, and the red line indicates the 20,000 mark, which is the Ramsar target for Vaswana. If we look at the chart, the green lines, we can see that in most years, at least on one of the months, the green line exceeds, goes above the red line. That means we've achieved our target. We've seen at least 20,000 birds on the, on the wetland at one time. But there are some years that it doesn't. And I draw your attention to year 2016 and 2018. In both those years, the numbers of birds did not exceed the Ramsar target. That raises questions as to why. You can also have a look at the patterns here and see that which month is the most popular month when we get the majority of birds. In general, you can see that December is the peak month, but sometimes that carries over to January. This again is influenced by a range of conditions and factors, such as water levels, such as temperatures, such as what else is happening elsewhere in Australia and potentially elsewhere in the world. Outside those peak times in December and January, the number of birds is generally fairly low, below the 5,000 mark. In fact, you can see if you look down the bottom of the graph that the wintry months, the June, July, August periods are generally very low. The next criteria for the Ramsar and relates to the Bass Wanner is the 1% species. So these are species that represent 1% of the population. Our first member of this club is the Australian shoveler. And the 1% criteria for this species is 1% of the Southwest of Australia population. So rather than the southwest of WA, the southwest of the entire continent of Australia. So we have generally received uh, shovelers here. The target for that is the red line is 250. And you can see that most years we have some lines above the red. The other thing to note for this species is that generally the peak numbers are in June, July. So these are winter pe periods. These birds turn up in our wetlands in winter. They might persist through to the spring months and then disappear over the summer generally and into autumn, they, they're gone completely. Most years, again, we achieve our target, our 250 target, but some years we don't. 
A second species for our 1% criteria is the Australian shell duck. This is also a criteria of 1% of the southwest of Australia population. Unlike the shovelers, these guys turn up in late spring into summer. And we see we have exceeded our target line, our red line, considerable, by considerable numbers many times before. Um, what we find here for these guys is that in the winter months, they're off breeding and they often disperse to inland areas where there's water, in farm dams, uh, in inland lakes, etc. But as the temperature rises in those inland areas and the water levels drop or evaporate, they move to the coast. So in October, we have a lot of Australian shell duck arriving, particularly with young animals. And so they spend the summer there, and the young mature, get ready for flight, and then they disappear. Other times of the year, you can see the numbers of shell duck are relatively low. While there are some always present and every month, generally only a couple of hundred. A third member of the 1% club is the red-necked avocet. And this is 1% of the entire Australian population. So for this criteria, anything that's above the red line means that at least 1% of the entire population is occurring at the Vaswana up system. Again, we can see here that these guys have a pretty much a summer into autumn uh, occurrence, generally in the summer periods. But when you get into the winter, into the spring months, they're disappeared. Um, often we get no birds. You can see also that in the orange line, 2019 year, we had significant numbers above our target. So instead of a target of around 1,100, we were getting nearly 2,500 animals. Can we explain this? It's an illogical explanation to why they've increased so much and then in subsequent years dropped down. To do this, you need to actually look about the whole of Australia and what the climate and weather patterns have been. And in 2019, much of the east coast of Australia was in drought. There was very little surface water for the wetlands on the east coast. So we suspect many of the birds for redneck avocet moved from the east coast to the west coast. And this is reflected in the numbers that we got. A final member of the 1% club is the black wing or pied stilt. And this is 1% of the Austral Asian population. So this is the species that occurs also in Southeast Asia in parts of. And so 1% represents the entire population of Australia and those that occur in Southeast Asia. Similar to the red necked avocet, these guys generally turn up in the warmer months. So November, December, January. Uh, the numbers can be quite large and again, the orange bars representing 2019, you can see we're well above the red line. Again, probably representing the dry east coast of Australia and their movement to the west coast. There are persistent numbers of these species all through the year, but the numbers drop considerably low. Um, there are various patterns here and we can see that some years they persist. So if we look at the purple line, 2018, reasonably good numbers of black wings still were here on the vast one wetland all through to May. And then they took off and they turned up again in November and into December. So these four species demonstrate highly variable patterns. And you can see that the populations vary um, and that the use of the wetland changes seasonally and yearly. So we've done a lot of bird counting We've got some patterns and we've got some graphs, but do the numbers stack up? What are the trends over the longer periods of time? We're very fortunate for Vaswana is that we have some early data. Uh, most of the wetlands in WA don't have a lot of data, but we have some detailed data of bird counts commencing in 1986 for a three year period. And then again in 1998, 99 through to the 2000s, and then our most recent stuff that we commenced in 2015. So if we look at this chart, and we compare the green lines, the orange lines, and the re more recent blue lines, we can see that in the early counts, in the mid 80s, we were regularly exceeding the 20,000 birds that was expected for Bass Warner. In fact, in January 1988 to 89, we had nearly 30,000 birds. Similar story for the late 90s into 2000, where we actually peaked around the 37,000. 
But again, that changed dramatically the next year. In our most recent counting, the last five years, although we have exceeded the 20,000 in most years, has not been to the same extent in those previous iterations of counting. Are there any explanations for this? Well, there could be many, but one of the fundamental things that's changed over that 34 years is the way that the water levels are maintained and manipulated over the summer months. So in the 80s period, there's no summer water level. So there's no inflow of sea level. The wetlands pretty much dried up every summer. Um, in the mid 90s, early late 90s to early 200s, there was a recognition there was a, probably a need to let some water in, particularly at the surge barrier areas in relation to fish deaths and other things. And so a small amount of seawater was let in and maintained in the vast in particular at minus 0.1 HC. And then in the more recent years, in the blue figures, we've done a series of trials of water levels and manipulations to try and control other aspects of the wetland. The fish kills, the algal blooms, the odour, etc. And one of the previous presentations covered a lot of that detail. The other thing we have for Vaswarup on a longer trend is we have a series of counts and data that relate to the international treaty species. And these go back over 37 years. So I've selected five species as examples here to see how they're trending. So between that 80s period, the late 90s to 2000s and the more recent times. So what we can see for the majority of them is the numbers have declined. So compare the current blue bar charts with the other colors and you can generally see that the blue is much lower than the preceding decades. And that's across the board for all species. Is there explanations for this? Well, there could be many explanations for this. And one of the challenging factors for Vaswana in the management of the water birds is to figure out what influence different scales have on the ability of birds to present and make use of the wetlands. So when we're considering these questions, we need to think at the global scale, particularly for the international species. We then have the national scale, as I've talked about, changes in drought and rainfall conditions across the country. And then we have local influences. Some of the things that might influence the numbers and the types of birds, the species of the birds turning up include climate change, the various annual rainfall patterns in the Southwest and at a national scale, loss of habitat globally, nationally and locally. Has the habitat still there, but has it changed? Is it no longer suitable for certain species? The influence of invasive species, whether it be animals, plants, fish, they can all influence the birds. And have we changed the management of the wetlands? As I said, we've been manipulating water levels and other things in recent years. Maybe that's been good. Maybe that hasn't been good for the water birds. That question's still unresolved. Despite all those, that's why is still a great place for water birds. Let's have a look at a comparison between that's one up and our nearest next Ramsar site, which is the Peel Harvey Yagarup Lakes based in Mandra. So the Peel Harvey is a much larger wetland system, 25,000 hectares. And as a result, it can have a lot more birds. The peak numbers for Peel Harvey have been up to 150,000. So this means that water bird abundance is roughly six, 5.9 birds per hectare. That's one water body is much smaller, only 750 hectares. And we've had peak numbers of up to 37,000. But when you do the calculations, that means we average 49.3 birds per hectare. So we have a lot higher density and a lot more birds per hectare at the Bass Warrant than you do at Peel Harvey. This is one of the things that makes Bass Warrant a really good site for water birds. The other thing is if you keep your eyes peeled, you can actually see and potentially find lots of interesting things in the water birds. One of the assets, one of the considerations for that swan one of the other things that make it important is the black swans. So that swan has the largest regular breeding aggregation of black swans in the state. We regularly have over 200 pairs every year breeding here. And while some other places can have a greater number of swans, on occasional years, such as inland lakes. These guys pretty much here all year, every year breeding around. 
The other issue is that there is always potential for individuals from various locations across Australia and across the world to turn up at Vaswana. The second image below the swans on the right hand side is a little red neck stint. This is one of the international species. If you look close, you can see an orange flag on one of the legs. So this is a bird that's been caught, captured, had its various measurements done and a flag put on it. This particular individual was caught on the East Coast in Melbourne, flagged at one of the popular wetlands there, and a few days later turned up at Vaswana. The bottom picture of that very striking duck is one of the vagrant species that has turned up. This is a Northern Pintail duck. Very unusual. Only a few individuals have ever turned up in Western Australia. And this particular individual turned up near the bird hive, which is the bigger picture in the slide, and stayed there for three or four days about four years ago. You never know what you're going to see, just keep your eyes peeled. What I've got now is just a few short video excerpts. These are indications if you're out and about, the chances of what you might see in the vast one art system, particularly over the summer months when we have our peak numbers of birds. This is the Wannerup system. This is taken in late January in 2019. And you can see many hundreds, if not thousands of birds gathered in the shallow waters, ranging from the stilts and avocets to, to various duck species, to cormorants on the fence posts. There's some swans in there. There's a number of the international migratory things as well. So, highly dense, lots of birds, all within relatively close vicinity, make it a really good spot for bird watching. This little video shows red-necked avocets, one of our 1% species, and some banded stilts feeding in a little group. The interesting note here is they're prepared to duck their heads under the water. And even the common things can be interesting. Here's silver gull, but look at that unusual foot action. Splashing around in the shallows, stirring up the mud, bringing up little invertebrates and things for it to feed. So it's a bit of a news shot for you. Gulls can survive without fish and chips. All right, so that was just a really brief introduction to the types of water birds some of the conservation issues associated with the water birds that are found in the vast water up system and a little enticement to get out, go and have a look for yourself. It's easy to do. And there's plenty of opportunities, particularly over the summer months. I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Kim. Um, if you stop your screen share now, there we go. Um, that was a fantastic Fantastic overview of water birds in the vast water up. Um, to the viewers out there, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat box. You can click on that and type in your questions now for Kim to answer. Um, just at the end there, you said, Kim, that people can get out there and have a look at the water birds. What, um, what are the ways that you recommend people can see water birds in the vast water up or access it or get involved? Oh, there you go. That's our first question too from Jen. <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's a couple of opportunities, Sally. So there are two bird hides that exist for the Bass Wannara. Mm. One uh, on the Malbuck Creek near uh, Wannara House, the historic National Trust House. And that has a boardwalk leading to it. Um, and that's a good place to go. There's always lots of stuff generally in front of the bird hide. And the other one is near Ford Road, back from Ford Road. There's a bird hide, not necessarily specifically in Bass Warner, but in the connection of the wetland that flows into Bass Warner. Each of those provides different opportunities and different habitats. And pretty much any time of the year, you'll see some types of water birds at both of those sites. Um, otherwise, 
there are a couple of access points that you can walk through. So as in um, natural areas between some private lands, so you can walk through to the edges of the wetlands. That's particularly the case on the Wanarup wetland and you can get there on the coastal side. Can be a little bit scary in summer when the grass is long and the snakes are active, but if you're prepared for that, got your gum boots, you should be fine. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got a question here um, about aeroplanes and do they interrupt the water bird life on the wetlands? Uh, that's a good question. Um, when we're doing our early morning counts, particularly in the Wanarup, when they're at sunrise, we regularly see a number of the FIFO flights that are coming into Bustleton early in the morning. And they fly down the coast, directly over the wetlands, heading to the Bustleton airport. Just about a one or up, they put their landing gear down. So we hear and see that all the time. And that was certainly a concern for the flight paths for planes coming over the wetlands with an increase in potential commercial flights coming out of Bustleton airport. Um, there was some work done on that and various consultancies were done, but from my own observations, it's quite unusual that the birds actually take flight. It can happen, but it's very unusual. Uh, and generally they just come a short distance up into the air, five minutes in the air and they land back down where they were disturbed from. Most times though, the birds don't even look up at the planes. They just completely ignore them. Great, so not too disruptive for them. Um, okay, our next question from Julia. She says she's been seeing a spoonbill around and she's wondering if they come and visit the area or the wetlands often. Yeah, so yellow-billed spoonbills, as opposed to royal spoonbills with the dark bill, yellow-billed spoonbills are pretty much regulars in the Bass Wanderup. And at certain times of the year, particularly in the summer months, their numbers can increase considerably. So it's not unusual across the entire wetland to see 30, 40 plus spoonbills. Um, they particularly work the shallow edges of the wetland system. Um, pretty common, and you often see them at the bird hide, particularly at the malboat hide. Thank you for that, Kim. We've um, got another question about uh, leg bands. Um, you mentioned in your talk that you saw one that had um, come from the Eastern States. Do you see that very often, birds with leg bands? And is there any process that you have to follow if you see them? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, no, banded birds are a bit rare. You don't see them very often. And particularly for wetland birds and the little waders, um, because their legs are covered in mud. So you actually find, find it hard to find and see the bands. Uh, the one I showed in the photo had a leg flag as opposed to a leg band. Leg band's a little metal tube. The flags are a plastic bit that sticks out, makes it a little bit more easy to see. Uh, we have seen for over the last five years, maybe three or four banded or flagged birds, generally the smaller waders. Uh, but it's always worthwhile keeping an eye out because across the world there are extensive banding programs. Many thousands of birds are banded every year. And there is always the opportunity that one of those will turn up and you'll get to see it. If you do see one, a uh, couple of things you can do straight away. If you've got your camera with you, it really helps to take a photo. Even though it might look small, you can zoom in on an image and you might actually be able to read the number or the code on it. The main thing for the waders though is the colour and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's only one leg flag. So a number of the combinations have multiple flags with multiple colours. Each country is assigned a certain colour code and a colour system. And so if you can just identify the two colours or the three colours there and the position, white is on top of the blue, the green is under the yellow, whatever it is, that will give you some clues to find out which country it is and there is uh, formal process just to nominate that information back to some of the banding communities to get some information about that individual bird. Great, so another way that people can get involved if they're out there looking at the water birds. Yeah. Um, questions are flying in. We have another one here about um, international shorebird species. And is there any um, comparison with the numbers we have here in Vast One Art compared to the Peel? Um, <clears throat> With the Peel being such a larger wetland overall, the potential is to have more of the international species at the uh, Peel Harvey Yagrat Lakes. Uh, and that does occur, definitely. Um, what's not necessarily 
as simple to, or straightforward to understand is which species go to which wetlands. While there are some species that are relatively common, the little redneck stinks and some of the sandpipers, there are other species that tend to have preference for certain wetlands and we don't necessarily understand why. So for instance, in the Batswana, while we do get both species of the godwits, the bigger birds that can fly nonstop from Siberia to Australia, we generally only get three or four individuals. Other wetlands can often get 15 to 20, for instance. So it really depends a bit on the individual species and the conditions and the food availability at the time. Um, but on, a, on any one day, you'd have to think that the wetlands for the Peel Harvey and the adjoining wetlands close to Peel Harvey probably contain more international waders than what Vass Fauna are Great, thanks Kim. Um, the next question we have is um, based around water levels. So given that we're um, regularly letting seawater in now, is there an ideal water level depth that would suit most species of birds? Is there, or a, they're all different? They're all different. I wish there was a pick A level and everyone, or all the birds made use of that. No, unfortunately it doesn't work like that. Um, because there's a range of different feeding ecologies, a range of different uh, dimensions of the birds, leg heights, bill heights, all those types of things. Uh, there's not one standard water level that suits all species. Um, we have actually done some work uh, over the last couple of years in, for all the species that we know that occur in Bass Warner, identifying the minimum and maximum water levels that we think each of those species can tolerate, withstand, and what would be an ideal for each species. But it's not as simple as just the water levels. So what we now understand and increasingly getting some information about is the types of feeding behavior and the types of uh, areas that the birds exploit. So you would have seen from some of my videos that we saw the one with the avocet and the stilts, they were ducking their head under the water. So they can actually handle fairly deep water. But in the first video, those same species were right on the edge of the wetland, completely exposed and just in a few centimeters of water, they were feeding there. So it depends on what they're feeding, what the requirements are, et cetera. We've also recently learnt that uh, in some scientific journals that the microbial algal slime that's in the very edge of the water, the wet mud zone, if you like, a lot of, uh, some, some of the international waders make use of the microbial slime and they feed on that. So they need very shallow waters to do that. One of the things we do think is important is that rather than keep a constant water level, if the water level continually changes over the summer months and evaporates, it exposes fresh areas of wet mud. Into that mud is a lot of the invertebrates that many of the waders feed on. And so if you're exposing fresh mud every day or two, you're exposing fresh food for them and they're quite happy with that. You need to keep in mind that one of the key reasons, the key functions of the Baswana wetlands for those international birds over those summer months is to eat. They need to pack on as much body fat and food and, and condition as they can in order to make the flight back to the northern hemisphere for the breeding season. If they can't get enough food or they have too much disturbance and they're flying rather than feeding, that can jeopardise their chances of getting back to the northern hemisphere. Great, thanks Kim. We've got um, a couple of questions here about black swans. Um, Someone's joined in late, so I wasn't sure if we've covered it, but I don't think we have. Um, how long do the swans visit the wetlands for while they're breeding? Because um, this particular viewer has noticed them around Ford Road. And the second swan question um, is asking how far outside of the vast swan area do you measure? Um, they've seen some, um, some black swans breeding around Yellow Yellup, so. Okay. Um, both good questions. So. You can pretty much find some swans on the wetland all year round. Uh, the numbers fluctuate, particularly in the breeding season, which is the winter, spring, and then in the late autumn when the birds are gathering and the swans are gathering to mate up and pair up again, the numbers can be quite high there. So while birds, while the swans are present all year round, the peak numbers when you have adults and when breeding has finished and the cygnets um, are close to being fledged, so they're growing up. It's not unusual to have many thousands of swans on those days. Um, but they're highly mobile, and once once the 
once breeding's finished and the cygnets are pretty much self-sustained, they can fly, uh, many of the birds will take off and go to other wetlands and other wetland locations. One of the interesting things for many water birds, particularly ducks and swans, is they fly a lot at night and they transfer from one site to another at night. Um, other places that we monitor birds in, yes, we do do a few other sites um, in the southwest corner, if you like. So we have a regular monitoring system and count in the Broadwater wetlands, which is a, a reasonable sized wetland halfway between Bustleton and Dunsborough. We have uh, fairly regular counting in Benja Swamp, which is near Harvey. It's a 500 hectare wetland system. Um, and then there's some less regular, but uh, counting that's done for selected species at a range of other wetlands. Uh, also important to note is the community involvement. So members of the community that belong to BirdLife International uh, often conduct surveys and counts of their favorite wetland spot and keep tallies and records of that. And that information is often put into the statewide databases. There's a range of those and that information is used to help make decisions as well. Um, swans in themselves, highly dynamic, highly mobile uh, and can be in anywhere where there's a decent set of water and food for them to breed. Great, thanks Kim. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about um, some different threats or potential threats to the water birds. One around um, any feral species like cats and foxes that might be a threat to our water birds. The other one is asking if any of our migratory species are the subject of hunting. So I think they probably mean hunting from people, not hunting from predators. Mm -hmm. So got any thoughts okay. about those two threats? Um, all right, let's start on ferals. So foxes, cats, um, and occasionally dogs. Uh, yes. Foxes in particular are a constant um, problem around the vast fauna up. And every second month that we're doing a count, we would invariably see a fox around the edge of the wetlands, particularly over the summer months. Um, the eastern side of the wetland, those portions of it that are, are in the Truett Forest National Park, do have a monthly fox baiting program in those sections, and that's been going for 20 years. Um, but the western side, so the coastal side, given its proximity to urban uh, housing and other issues there, it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to put poison baits, logically. Uh, we're working on, hopefully working on a plan to have us to do that with some additional fencing and other things that will separate the baits from people and dogs. But yes, feral animals, foxes in particular, are bad. Um, the birds themselves, do tend to get used to the fox present. So a couple of times now when we've been doing our counts, we've seen foxes trolling up and down the edge of the wetland in the sandfires. Uh, they've decided they're gonna get from one side of the wetland to the other. They hit the water, they walk until they have to swim. It doesn't flush the birds. The birds just swim gently away, put a bit of a buffer between the fox and it, keep an eye on it and it swims across a bit like uh, someone having the traffic stopped and it swims across, gets to the other side and away it goes. So the birds are wary, but they're not necessarily panicked by the presence of a fox. Having said that, one of the key uh, mortality issues for ducklings and for cygnets in particular is fox predation, particularly at night. So yes, it is a problem. Cats are much, much stealthier, harder to spot. We do occasionally see a cat around the edges of the wetland. I think most of the, most of the ducks and the big birds are, are too large for a cat to tackle, but certainly uh, freshly hatched ducklings would be uh, an easy target for many of them. Um, so it is an issue and it's something that ideally needs to be addressed, but the, the challenges of feral animal control in basically an urban setting um, make it very difficult. Mm. And the second question, what was that, Sally, please? The second part of it was about, um, about hunting. I, I'm assuming they oh, mean yeah. not from predators, from people, so are, are any migratory species subject to hunting here or um, I guess elsewhere on their path? Yeah, so, so, certainly not in Australia. So duck hunting and, and uh, taking of birds for food or recreational pleasure has been banned in most states for many, many years. Mm. But it can be a problem on the flight path uh, for some of our waders 
particularly in places such as China or Korea. Uh, many of those countries have done a lot of work to try and um, ban or prevent the taking of animals on the migratory path. But uh, my understanding is that it still happens in some places. Uh, mainly though, I don't, I don't understand or I don't believe that hunting is a major contributor to the decline in numbers of waders. It's principally been about habitat loss and changed environment that has uh, prevented uh, access to the necessary food sources on the stopovers that they need to come to Australia and then back again. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, a question here about um, whether, whether water birds breed here. So we've um, heard a lot about them breeding on the flight path in other places and then coming here to, to fill their bellies. Do we have many species that breed on the wetlands? Uh, we do have resident species. So many of the duck species and the swans obviously will breed here. Um, many of the duck species will actually breed in tree hollows. So that connection with the Chewett Forest National Park and the large numbers of tree hollows that are in the Chewett trees is a particularly important ecological linkage that goes through there. And then some of the ducks, the Pacific Blacks and the Great Teals are very common species. You can find them uh, nesting in sedges and reeds around the edge of the wetland. And they'll, uh, if you walk through, you don't know they're there because they're hiding. They'll wait to the last moment before they break cover and take off and it'll scare you big time. <laughs> uh, but um, most of them will breed not so much around the fringes of the wetland in the sedges, but make use of the tree hollows and or other places. A lot of the duck species, as I said before, will go to inland areas when the, in the winter when there's water, farm dams and other inland wheat belt lakes, etc. Uh, breed there and then bring themselves and their young to the coastal wetlands for the summer period. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, I'll just do a quick time check there because we're a couple of minutes past our finish time. So um, if any viewers need to leave on time, um, you can do so now, um, but please fill in your two minute survey. Otherwise we can keep going for another 10 minutes or so um, with a few more questions. And I'll move on to the next one now, which is about IBIS. Um, this person's noticed that we seem to have a significant number of IBIS around and are these um, impacting on the migratory visitors and their food supply or, or are they not too much of an issue? Hmm. Okay, yeah, so the, the infamous bin chicken, as they've been called in the last few years. Uh, the two species of ibis that we, we get around the wetlands all year round. So that's the Australian white ibis and the straw-necked ibis. Uh, we do occasionally over the summer months get a third species called the glossy ibis. Glossy ibis is a little bit smaller than the other two and dark in colour all over. Um, no, there's no impact from the ibis on our international species or our resident duck species, etc. Ibis feed around the edges of the wetland sometimes. Most of the time they're actually in the cleared land in the paddocks and the farmlands. They're eating insects and beetles and other bits and pieces, but not necessarily eating the same types of food that ducks and waders and spoonbills require. So, no competition. Where you do notice the ibis, uh, particularly in Busseldon and along Layman Road, is where they breed in the Melaleucas. So they can, you can see places where there are many hundreds of breeding ibis clustered in the small Melaleuca stands and it looks like they're, they're dominating lots of things. Uh, it is a fair comment to say that straw-necked ibis, the black and white ones in particular, have generally increased in number over the last 20 years. And we do see that, and we do get people concerned about that. Um, we often have complaints from people about an individual ibis in suburbia walking down the front yard or down the backyard or whatever it is. Uh, and that, that can make people a bit unsure about what to do when they've got such a large bird in their backyard. There is no issues with that. There's no threats. They're not gonna hurt you. They'll take in fact, most times they're doing you a favour. They're eating the lawn beetles or the grubs and bits and pieces out of your garden. And as soon as they've fed and exploited all they can, they'll be off to somewhere else. So bin chickens can stay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll um, give people a chance to scramble in any last um, questions. And while we're waiting for them to do that, if they wish, um, I was just curious, Kim, what do you think are the future research needs for waterbirds on the wetlands? Um, given that the monthly monitoring is winding up in 
December. Um, what, what do you think we need to keep an eye on in the future? Uh, we certainly need to keep an eye. Well, there's many unanswered questions about the ecology and the requirements of the, the various waterbird species on the bass one. One of the key things is the link between the food resources, the water level management, salinity management, and the timing of those things when the birds need them. So we're, we need a lot more information to know that how we manage the wetlands is either benign or at least not negatively impacting on the feeding ecology of the birds. So that's an area that needs quite a lot more work. Um, we certainly need a bit more information, uh, monitoring information on partitioning of the resource and the wetlands by species. So where are the best feeding areas for species A versus species B? And how does that change over time, over weekly time, monthly time, seasonal, annual time, etc. So a lot of that information is basically just bird observation. Where are they? How many? What are they doing at that point of time? And then making a note of those types of things and then mapping that back across the wetland. So that's an area that um, casual public observations, community observations can help. There's, uh, there's lots of things that you can do and see and make note of that will be useful in that context. I think the other particular important piece of information is being able to put what's happened or what's happening in the vast water up into context with other major wetlands. So we've said that the numbers fluctuate on a monthly basis. Where do those birds go? Where do all the swans go? We've had some instances where late May, the wetland's relatively dry, there's a little bit of water in there and there might be 20 swans rainfall comes and within a 12 hour period, we've got 60 or 70 swans back into the system. Where did they come from? So there's plenty of those types of questions that we don't yet understand. We're definitely not done yet. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got um, a question here about um, what is the trend of water quality in the vast one up in general? Um, I guess a comment on that is that that was the topic of the last um, the last webinar so you can find um you can watch that webinar still it was recorded on the geocatch youtube channel but did you have any comments kim about the water quality in the wetlands in general uh it's highly dynamic and it changes seasonally so yeah. it ranges from a complete freshwater system following winter rainfalls and flow out of the catchment to traditionally a hypersaline system almost dry in the middle of summer you can't get to bigger extremes than that so uh, it changes dynamically. There are some nutrient issues, and we've seen that with various algal blooms over the years, et cetera. Um, that's a big question, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not equipped to answer that fully. So Yeah, you know. check out the previous webinar. It'd be, yeah, yeah the very dynamic system managed for a lot of, a lot of um, different issues. Uh, so probably our final one, I think, someone wants a bit more detail about where that uh, Ford Road bird hide is. Can you give me a bit more information? Um, yes, I'm just going to look across to the map I've got up. So if you go off Peel Terrace and go onto Pioneer Cove Road, there's a little uh, public open space area at the end of there and there's a walk trail that will take you to that. So it's on the coastal side of the wetland um, and on the Bustleton Town side of Ford Road. It's a, it's a city of Cove. Bustleton managed facility. Great, thanks for that. Um, someone's asked if we can mention the seminar on the 26th of November. I think that one is the Lower Vass River um, community update. Um, if people are interested um, in that, I think there's some information on the City of Bustleton website. Um, some emails have gone out from Geocatch. Um, but for now, I think we're out of questions. Thank you so much, Kim, um, for that very informative talk and some great Q&As there. Um, this was the final webinar in the Fast One Up webinar series. So thanks to Kim and all the other presenters. Um, and thank you all for joining us.